Hey, everybody. Welcome to Naval Gazing, the Valley Indie Podcast. Today, we're talking about economic redevelopment in downtown Ansonia. And joining me for this episode is Ansonia Mayor David Cassetti. Hello, Mayor. How are you, everyone? Thanks for taking a couple of minutes. I really appreciate it. No problem. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. And then Economic Development Director and Grant Writer, Sheila O'Malley. Hi, Sheila. Hi, Eugene. Thanks for having us. My pleasure. And Corporation Counsel, Mr. John Marini. Thanks a lot for talking to us, Eugene. And very I, nice facial hair, very nice handlebar <laughs> mustache. You know what? I, I, I've decided that uh, the way I feel about 2020, I'm just going to carry it on my face. I'm just I'm going for the look. This is how the year feels. I saw that at, at the debate, actually. I saw the, the, uh, the, was that the debut of the handlebar? Was the, uh, the Democratic debate earlier in the week? I, I guess that's what, yeah, that's when it was widely seen by the public. I so. was so impressed, I grew my own. And I didn't start until right after that debate. But uh, all right, John. results so far. Since. Last time I saw John, he, we were being, he was being interviewed by an NPR reporter. And I just had to interrupt. This was at the uh, 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 Main I Street, remember. the, uh, the $600,000 grant you guys got. Uh, and I just had to ask John, John, how are you not sweating? Uh, which seemed to throw John off for a second. But uh, anyway, wait, enough, enough sh uh, schmaltzing. Uh, before I begin, I just want to read an important announcement because I don't want to take up your whole day. But COVID-19 has changed life as we know it. And the Valley needs your help now more than ever. The region's health and human service providers face unprecedented challenges in meeting the needs of those affected by the pandemic. Some organizations are even at the risk of closing their doors, but you can make a difference right here in our community by joining with others in three ways. Give directly to Valley nonprofits, participate in the Valley United Way annual campaign, or support the Valley Community COVID-19 Response and Recovery Fund. Please visit valleyfoundation.org to learn more. So, Let's get right into it because you're all busy. Let's tackle 65 Main Street, which is going to be the future home of the Ansonia Police Department. Uh, in June, the Ansonia Board of Aldermen approved $3.1 million to finish the city's police station renovation, the senior center, and the community room. And that's according to an article from the Connecticut Post. A few years back, Voters authorized $12 million to build a new, a new police station on Olson Drive, but the city decided to go with a downtown right in the heart of Ansonia on Main Street. But I'm going to start off with a, a challenging question, because why not? I'm wondering, didn't the city make, or the administration, make this conversation about getting this extra $3 million more complicated than it had to be? by sort of saying when it was first introduced to the public, the idea to get $3.1 million more, that, well, it's not an underfunded project. We could finish the, finish the police station job. We have to finish these other things in there. But at the end of the day, I was under the impression that if you did not authorize an additional $3.1 million, there would be no police department on Main Street. Is that correct? Was it a little bit of spin there when it first came out? Whoever is, wants to tackle that? It's hard to talk about the PD without talking about the entire building and it is complicated. So I think that's where some of the confusion came into play because there's a lot of stuff that needs to be done to the entire building in order to accommodate the police station. And so you have to kind of talk, talk in, the, in context when you're, when you're talking about the police station because the building's so large, because the mechanical and electrical have to have to go throughout the entire building, you're actually talking about two floors, but you, in essence, I guess, were talking about the police station to begin with. Um, I mean, was it, was it, it, it's not, isn't it accurate to say it was underfunded considering the original project wasn't on Main Street. It was uh, to build new construction on Olson Drive. It was a completely different project. So yeah, yeah it's, it's entire, entirely accurate to say that that project got bigger. And when it got bigger, despite the best efforts to hold the line, it got more costly. And so I think it's 100% accurate to say, look, shifting to this new project, you're getting a lot more for the money, but we needed 
We need more money to, to, to get the job done. Uh, if you took all the money and you put it into that police station floor, would you get a finished police station? Yes. But as Sheila says, you can't remove that complication. There's so much else to the building, including that tower that provides me, access to all floors that, that it was really impossible to, to not talk about it in the scope of the totality of the building. Would you have, would you have had a, a workable police station? Like a, if the 3.1 million had not been improved, approved, would the police officers be able to use the new police department? With a, with a change oh. of scope that would leave the other floor unusable and that would leave the other second functions. Floor. The, second, the second floor would, would not be renovated. It needs to be renovated. You'd have a brand new he, police station on the top floor and underneath would be, but, not, would be renovated. I know what, I, yeah, I know what you're I'm just asking. Saying, yeah, would be a police yeah. station? That's all I'm trying yeah. to ask. Um, I, I guess it would be usable. There are portions of it um furniture and equipment that had to be upgraded um so that would not be able to be upgraded so i mean the scope right. of the project would have to be tailored such that the station got done but that none of the rest of the building got improved cutbacks would have to be made on items like the tower and in terms of the police station floor you probably wouldn't be talking about any new furniture you probably wouldn't be talking about a lot of those modernizations and you're going to, you know, it would be very risky with the furniture, but would you be able to bring the police over there at the end of the day? Yes. But again, it didn't make sense to go that direction given that number one, you're changing the scope of what's needed for a proper police station. And number two, that entire building needed work to, to serve the public. Okay. And, and, and the vote, and I, I'm sorry, go ahead, Sheila. I'm sorry, uh, Eugene, no, okay. but I don't think Mayor Cassetti wanted a PD station in there with a vacant, I'm not going to speak for you, Mayor, you're on the uh, call, no, I, but with a vacant you renovate uh, that bottom floor. floor. Yeah. You needed to renovate that bottom floor. The $12, $12 million was more than enough to do the police station, but that was based on, and they voted on Olson Drive. Since we shifted it over to Main Street, it's a bigger building, as we explained, but that bottom floor had to be renovated. It was dilapidated. It needed to be renovated. Yeah, and so That's let's what talk. It's being used for. Let's talk now going forward. Uh, Mayor Cassetti, why do you think it's important to have the police station at that location? And then what's the status of the construction there? When do we think the officers will actually move in and it'll be up and running? I'm anticipating by March of next year to be, have the grand opening to be in there. Um, the reason why I wanted it on Main Street is because Main Street is exploding with development. I mean, we got 200 apartments coming on. I mean, it's a walkable Main Street. Police presence is very important down on our Main Street. Okay. And then uh, before we head into some of the, the other projects, I just wanted to ask in general, you know, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic is still with us. Yes. Although uh, Connecticut managed to uh, flatten the curve and right. we're certainly weren't as hit as hard as other places. Uh, I, I, you know, there's still a feeling of in uncertainty as we're sending our kids back to school or not. Uh, in terms of the economy and this redevelopment that is just poised to happen uh, in Ansonia on your main street, is the economic impact or potential uh, economic impact from COVID going to affect any of this? And I don't know. Oh, who... everything, all, all, everything's in order. I mean, the, the developer is ready. He's already starting demolition. Um, I met with a couple of franchisees uh, that want to work on the commercial buildings. They're ready to move in. I mean, no, it's, it hasn't hampered it. Yeah, we've yeah. a lot um, of continued, I'll let Sheila go, but. We've gotten a lot of continued interest, but I want to double back to that police station project because public investment at this point is more important than ever. And so the, the fact that we have the ability to invest $15 million in a joint police station community center right in the hub of our uh, business district, is th that, that is absolutely phenomenal at this point in time. Um, because it's never been more needed to have public investment alongside and to continue to encourage our private investment and what our private investors are doing. And I know Sheila could talk a lot to the interest, the continued interest of investors in our downtown and city uh, on the whole. Yeah, explain yeah. that to me, Sheila, because I, I sit here as, a, as an ignoramus. I mean, I'm just a reporter, a local news reporter. But uh, I, 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 I'm confused as to how the economy, local, you know, jobs and construction can happen uh, when we're also hearing that businesses might go out. 
So help yeah, me Yeah, and the, you know, on the flip side of things, you have a lot of people who are looking for work and a lot of people who are gonna be competitively bidding on uh, developers projects. So they're getting labor cheaper, they're getting cheaper prices, so they're more willing to move quickly in order to take advantage of that. I, I agree with you. I mean, I think you're gonna see uh, long-term effects and you're, you're not gonna realize them for, for a while, but right now it's, it's almost, um, you know, incredible that development is continuing and happening and moving quickly. Like I'm, you know, we're putting projects out to bid. The developers are, as the mayor and John said, the developers are starting demo, internal demolition, uh, partial demolition on our, our buildings, and they're willing to go forward. I mean, they may be um, a little bit unusual in that it's their money and they move at their pace. Uh, a lot of people rely on banks and so forth to free up the money that to move forward with the with the projects. But um, our projects already in motion. But yes, I mean, I think somewhere down the line you're gonna you're gonna feel the impact. But right now, development seems to be moving forward, and I think uh, again because developers are taking advantage of the reduced rates they're getting and the labor that's abundant. Um, people want to work. They don't, they, they want to get back to work and a lot of them have lost their jobs or have, you know, are looking for new work. So I think that plays in our favor. And we and, want to show as well, the, the investors that the city has skin in the game as well. And 65 Main Street certainly speaks to that. Uh, the way that we structured our agreement with Shaw uh, for the ATP Palmer and Feral Process Lab, that speaks to our ability, I think, to work with them to understand the obstacles they have to meet. And also the SHW building, you know, the city's agreement to actually take that property uh, and work with the state and federal government to get it assessed and, and remediated and eventually demoed. Now, the city is very much a present partner for developers uh, and business uh, owners here in the city. Um, we want it to continue despite what obviously some very, very trying times out there. And then in terms of say the ATP building, that's 497 uh, East Main Street. Uh, and you mentioned the Farrell former processing lab, uh, which is right next to it. And then the Palmer building. Uh, mayor Cassetti, you've grown up in Ansonia and, and now you've, you know, you've been the mayor for several terms. Uh, you know, those are some, with the exception of, I guess, the Palmer building, uh, describe what, I mean, if I, if I didn't know Ansonia, what do those buildings look like? Uh, and sort of what do they mean to Ansonia? And I'm, I guess I'm, I'm thinking of, there's one guy, I don't know who he is, but on every comment for years now, he's just kind of called them, here is our urban decay, like the Frankenstein monster right. in the middle of Ansonia. What? So... Go ahead. Yeah, well, you know, the, the processing lab at one time in the, up until the mid seventies was very busy. I mean, uh, it was what it was called, the processing lab. The, the ATP and Palmer building had the hat company in there. And then they decided after they went out of business to sell that. And I remember Duke Realty was gonna buy it or they did put it something down, but nothing ever came to fruition. I mean, they didn't, they didn't do anything with it. So now under my administration, I said, we really got to, you know, get this out to bid and, and, and get apartments. We need a walk in Main Street. I'm working now on the, on the rail station uh, of getting, working with MTA to see about getting a, a uh, new rail station because as these apartments go online, people are gonna be entering going by the train down to the Westchester County and Bridgeport and Fairfield County to work. So the, the, these apartments are what was needed here in Ansonia at this time. And to, to the mayor's point, the Palmer building at 153 Main Street. Right. I mean, again, that, the bottom floor was the senior center, or still is at the moment the senior right. center. Uh, Jody Gill, uh, who launched the Valley Indy with me, it seems like a thousand years ago. In 2014, she did a story uh, on the Palmer building, and she described the fourth floor. There were 12 unfinished shower stalls littered with cigarette butts, almost 25 years after being installed for what was supposed to be a fitness center uh, at East Main Street, 497 East Main Street, the ATP building. Uh, it looked as if the former owners had just abandoned it because there were still hats and sewing machines, uh, combined square footage of 99,000 square feet. And then she had this 
uh, the list of proposed businesses over the years. It was supposed to be these buildings, one or the other, I don't know which, an incubator office space for uh, startup companies, artists lofts, lofts, a fitness center, city offices, a community college, annex, upscale condos. I think that was the Duke plan that never went anywhere. Right, that was the Duke plan. More artist lofts. I mean, it, I, it almost seemed like these buildings were, were cursed at, at one point. So uh, let's switch right, the processing lab because I, I've read about what's going on there. Who owns that building? Who, what was the deal that was made? Uh, if somebody could bring me up to speed there. So Eugene, that's all part and parcel of the ATP Palmer project. And back to uh, what you were outlining, right? The history, the sad history of the, um, of the efforts to get redevelopment on Main Street proper in this area, consisting of the ATP Palmer and the big process lab that most people know as the shattered window building, right? Because our blight department counted them once. There's well over uh, at least eight, 900 uh, shattered windows in that thing, at least one side of that thing alone. Mm -hmm. So we realized that this is not an easy fix. It's been going on since the 80s, these efforts to rejuvenate this area. So we, we realized it's not as easy as putting a for sale sign and hoping the right developer scoops it up. Which was sort of literally done at one point. I'm sorry, go ahead. Which, which right. really had been done over and over again. And someone would come in with a great idea, but then they would, they would hit the obstacles, right? The idea that the cost of the renovation, the remediation wasn't worth the profit point. And so we approached it differently and we created an agreement that will provide incentives with results. And so you have the ATP Palmer, the ATP and Palmer buildings with the process lab and two other parcels. Shaw Development now owns them and they have the ability to develop these parcels within five years and unlock some very significant tax incentives. But if they fail to do so, if they fail to do it on that timeline, then the city properties revert back to the city and there are consequences. So we basically have an agreement that incentivizes results, but that protects the city in the meantime. It's a lot more of a, of a creative effort here, but we understand the history. We understand that this is no easy feat of just finding the right person. This is a, a need for the city to recognize that there are obstacles to development in this area, and we need to work together with our developers to overcome them. That's exactly what, what Sheila as uh, economic development director has specialized in and what the mayor has pushed that philosophy big time. The city needs skin in the game. It needs to be willing to roll up its sleeves and take some risks alongside its developers and its business owners. That's the way that we got the, uh, the road built that unlocked uh, Fountain Lake and got Farrell up there. It's the way that reme we remediated sites like um, the road ready site that was vacant and, and empty uh, until, until that came along. And it's the way we're gonna get demolition or remediation done on copper and brass. Um, but this, this project is basically more than ATP Palmer. It's ATP Palmer and all of those Pharaoh buildings. And it's a five year uh, project at most. And then in terms of, so Palmer and ATP were owned by the city, right? Those Correct. were city owned properties. Yeah. So did you sell them or do, how, how did that work out? How are they going, how are they transferring to Shaw? Yep. So the agreement was to give them to Shaw subject to this development agreement that creates milestones. So for, for example, the ATP Palmer, they need to be complete within two years. If they're not complete within two years, the city has an ability to exercise a reverter and take those buildings back. Moreover, they have to be developed according to the plan. So it's mixed market rate apartments and commercial. And that plan, well, the general plan was attached with the documents filed with the town clerk, approved by zoning. Um, and in fact, the site plan, uh, Sheila, you could talk a little bit to that, has had just been approved for that project. And then the longer project, the more difficult project is, of course, the pro uh, process lab. Now, the city didn't own that. Shaw owned it. So basically, it's, a, it's basically a commingling. You know, they own some properties. We own some properties. Put them together. And if they can get this entire project done in five years, the tax incentives will cover all five properties. So they'll get property tax incentives not only for the ATP and Palmer, but for 501 but they have to deliver. They have to actually get this project accomplished. And then what are the tax uh, incentives that they're getting? So the tax incentives are actually tiered. They get a certain amount of years 
without any taxes as they commence uh, the, the heavy lifting, right, the construction. And then it basically turns into a tiered system where the taxes increase, increase gradually over time until they hit 100%. I saw I, I think it was, the new full value, which will be improved as contemplated mixed commercial and market rate residential. I think uh, the post reported taxes for six years, uh, no taxes for six years, followed by five years of stable property taxes based on the current assessments. Is that an accurate? Yeah, that's a general. And then just in terms of what we're going to see there, uh, what exactly is going in? How many uh, apartments, uh, condominiums, I don't know what to call them, townhouses, and how much retail? We got 50. 50 to talk a little bit about the site plan. Right. 50, 50 there, 50 at ATP and Palmer, and 100 at the processing lab. So there's 200 apartments. And these are all, it's all market rate apartments? All market rate apartments, yes. Uh, one and two bedrooms. Is this like a geared towards millennials thing? How did the That's developer? Correct. That's correct, Eugene. That's what we want. That's why we want to fix the train station. They can, they can shop. They can do every. I want a walkable Main Street. I believe they can shop and do everything right on Main Street. Eat on Main Street. Go to the train station and go to work and come back home and they're there. And then in terms of uh, you know I was I was reading the old story by Jody, and then just from covering uh, say Derby development meetings over the years and, and just covering local news in general. Uh, and I don't mean to be cynical, but sometimes developers show up and they promise things. And then for one reason or another, it's not delivered, whether the economy tanks or internal problems within the company. And I'm just wondering how much the city, vet, I mean, this is unusual because it seems like you had your, the corporation council so involved, but how much vetting was done with these companies uh, and who are they? I'm looking at like a Ansonia P and Z application uh, proposal to modify building from commercial to mixed use from November 2019. It's AEPM International, which is located 200 Main Street and has some of the principals as Fletcher Thompson, which is housed there. Uh, and they're representing the building owner, which is Green US Builders LLC. Who is everybody uh, involved in this? I mean, John can talk about how the Shaw Growth Ventures, which is part of Green USA Builders. It's separate LLC, but it's there. It's like a joint venture between the two of them. But uh, and John can speak to how Shaw got involved. But you know, it's kind of a unique situation because uh, they owned 501 East Main Street, as John and the mayor had said. But but they, you know, they also play a huge role in whoever purchases ATP and Palmer. So it made more sense and was uh, more appealing to have that owner own all three buildings. And, and also they own 165 Main Street as well, which is the Wells Fargo property mm -hmm. um, and a portion of the 65 Main, which is the call, what's called Building 70. So they own, that's four or five, parcels now on that whole block. So it made sense for Shaw, which had acquired, acquired the properties through bankruptcy, right? A acquired 501 East Main Street and a portion of, or, or 65 Main Street. They acquired those through bankruptcy. So they were the, they are the owners. Um, and it made really good sense for them to, they, they were interested in redeveloping their buildings and it made really good sense to partner with them because and then in terms of what is Fletcher Thompson an owner of somehow or what, what is the, that or uh, a, AEPM international what is what is the involvement of, of them two architects involved with this project uh, actually they're going to be three or four architects involved but um uh a a EPM is uh submitted the site plan for approval the preliminary site plan for approval and then um, John I'm sorry Sheila go ahead nope oh, Go ahead, Eugene. John, in terms of uh, did the city go through their books and make sure all these companies can actually deliver? Do they have the financing? Is that even, uh, I mean, maybe that's not even legal, but because uh, there, you know, there is the sense in the Valley. We go ahead, John. Did, uh, certain documents have to be submitted. Um, as Sheila said, you know, we had a situation here with a pre-existing owner. 
and not only a, a pre-existing owner of, of one property, but of several significant properties right in the heart of the downtown. Now remember, there was a bit of an adversarial relationship between the city and Shaw as we took their building. We used eminent domain to force the fair market uh, value sale of 65 Main Street, the police station building, right? So what we were looking at was a situation where the city could continue an adversarial relationship. We could, well, right, we could take uh, the process lab through more eminent domain, or we could wait around for Shaw to develop. They expressed a desire to move forward with a commercial development. They stated that that was their goal in the area. Or we can go a third way, which was to see if we could work together. And the idea was they have strategically important space and a large amount of it downtown. We have the ATP Palmer buildings, which aren't gonna go anywhere as long as there's a giant dilapidated blighted property next door. That's no one's gonna buy it. That's what first question always, Yeah, the, the first question looking at the ATP Palmer building was, well, who the heck owns that other building next right. door? Right. <laughs> you know, the, how many you, hundreds and hundreds of windows smashed out, rebar sticking out of the ceiling, right. um, trees growing through the roof. Whose responsibility is that? And of course it's Shaw. So we kind of thought, listen, let's create an incentive here that would allow Shaw to move forward and be successful but that would also allow us to meet our goals, which is the redevelopment of this entire zone. But also let's have protections in place because Eugene, you're right, you never know who you are. Even the companies with the best uh, balance sheets, right, out there may not have the same goals as a city. You know, they may not be able to deliver. So the idea is how do we form a partnership that incentivizes results, but at the same time protects the city and the residents. If it works out, everybody wins. If it doesn't work out, we take this, the buildings back and, and make another effort. But, but let's make sure that this effort has a very good chance of succeeding. Let's not just take a risk, see who comes to the table and sell the buildings, potentially lose control. You know, that's the last thing that we wanted that's been done before. You're so, also- this, I, think, I would say the agreement re respects a reality, right? That, that a city needs to work with private development. We're not Walt Disney World. We can't just buy up every single piece in sight and develop it as we wish. And that's just not the reality of economic development. You're, you're also expecting an ex, uh, a return on, on our investment. And we're gonna get about 14 to $20 million in, uh, in private investment funds um, should they proceed along and complete the project. And I believe they will. And yes, there was some vetting. There's always vetting that goes through when you, when you put out a, um, a bid package. So they do, they do have other projects. They've done very large residential um, projects in other parts of the country. Uh, so we did, we did take a look at that. We looked at Green USA Builders and we also looked at Shaw um, because, you know, you want to, you want to be sure. But there was no request as with other developers in the past, there was no request for um, assistance to do the project for actual capital built, you know, the capital costs of the project. So uh, all of the project is being funded by them directly. And you know, I'm sorry, I interrupted again. I have a bad oh, habit. I do the same. Sorry. Go ahead. In terms of, uh, I mean, one thing that's sort of fascinating as someone who's been watching uh, city governments in Ansonia and Derby specifically, uh, try to deal with these really difficult, complicated projects where you have former factories and, and, and maybe there's brownfield sites, there's contamination, and uh, you have to deal with Rick Dunn. Uh, it's VCOG or NVCOG, I'm sorry. Uh, it's like there, there's, very, there's a sameness, as Sheila O'Malley might know, since she worked in Derby for a couple of years. Uh, I've heard talk, I mean, I have Kirk Miller on, on this podcast a lot because he likes microphones, uh, of, of maybe a regional development agency of some kind that's happening. Is there, is what's going, is Ansonia, Mayor, is Ansonia taking over? I, well, listen, good for you in Ansonia, yeah, but, you know, I live in Derby. Take the valley over, Eugene. That's what, yeah, we're, we're, we're working on putting that together. But, uh, but there's what's going on? In the past, Eugene, so it, there's been a general idea that, that regional development would work, 
that a development corporation could give us here, not just in Ansonia, but in the Valley, a bit of an edge. Uh, the problem, I think, is that we weren't there with the projects yet. But there's so much potential waiting to move forward in Ansonia, I think downtown Derby as well, even Seymour, that a development corporation at this point, similar to what's in Shelton or Hamden or Waterbury, I think it makes perfect sense now for Ansonia in the Valley. I think and what does it look like, John? Because I'm, I'm remember, I'm an idiot. So what's the difference? How does it, how does it work? Why? Uh... I think a redevelopment agency gives you a lot more flexibility. Right. It's difficult to operate as government doing economic development because, as you know, you can't move quickly. You have to go through a series of steps and processes. You can't acquire property that's contaminated without the ability to um, take on some liability and a redevelopment agency could do that. Um, there's all, there, there yeah. are all sorts of ad advantages to having a quasi municipal agency. Yeah, from, uh, a mechanical, from a mechanical standpoint, as Sheila uh, alludes to, there's that ability to keep at arm's length. A lot of cities, they get very scared diving into these uh, properties, these problem properties. And it's with good reason. There is risk, right? And the smaller you are as a community, the more risk there is. I think about Waterbury, of course. Waterbury has so many of these properties. Um, it, you know, how many copper and brass? I mean, Sheila says sometimes that they have maybe five or six, if not more, copper and brasses. Mm. They have, they, yeah, they have over 400 brownfields properties. I, I was in uh, Eugene, I was in Derby for seven years. Not not two. Oh no, I was joking. I said a few. Okay. I was, I'm okay. sorry. I was. Okay. I didn't. Was I know. Long time. It felt like a long time, but but anyway. <laughs> Water, I mean, Waterbury you, kind of pioneered, right? In, in in terms of the development corporation, how it could be used to insulate the city from liability, get funding into these properties while keeping them at an arm's length from from the municipality, so that the concern about you know budget the budgets, you know, and putting city money, tax money into those properties. Yeah was somewhat, and, you know. Yeah, and Eugene, you brought up, yeah, Eugene, you brought up a good point. The, there are complicated sites that are left here because they're complicated without, you know, any development on them because of the difficulty. And I think, I think it makes perfect sense for Valley communities, i.e. Derby, Seymour, and Ansonia, to have a redevelopment agency just because of these complicated sites, right? Take them out of the, um, the cities and the municipalities and put them in an, a redevelopment agency. Easier to get money, to funnel money into these projects, easier to get them cleaned up, um, uh, more, more power, more bang for your buck when you're all together in a re with a redevelopment agency. And I think the mayor and John, uh, you know, and I, we, we all spoke about transitioning our economic development commission into a redevelopment agency. But as John had said, we weren't really ready at that point. I think now we've got a lot going on. We've got a lot of communities that want to want to regionalize or at least talking about it. So it makes perfect sense. Right. And Mayor Cassetti, have you reached out to, let's say, Mayor Zekin in yes. Derby and that guy in Seymour to talk about this? Have they been receptive? I mean, Kurt Miller. Kurt Miller has been very receptive. I'm yet to talk to Zeke about it, but this is what we need to do, a regionalization of, of our economic development. This, this, it will be able to get more funding, a lot more funding, because I want to really, I've been saying it for four years about clear, cleaning up Ansonia Copper and Brass, getting them buildings down and get that remediated, open that up. I mean, I've been talking with um, uh, uh, the real estate part of Amazon and, and, and trying to showcase this to them and say, you know, I want to build that road that leads out to Route 8 through the property of the woodlot. I mean, there's many things that I want to do. And I think together, regionally, we can, we can get this done. And the biggest, I would assume that the biggest uh, roadblock to any of this is money. You're talking money, about. Right. But if we're together, funding will come. We'll the state it. needs to be, Eugene, the state needs to understand and needs to be educated on the idea that there is no greater return on investment than here in the Valley. The funding necessary to take down all of copper and brass and revitalize an economic generator for the entire region could be done um, with the same amount of money that maybe a couple buildings 
in Fairfield County are being rehabbed with. Um, it's amazing to see how far a comparatively little amount of funding here in the Valley would go. And I don't think, you know, that we've, we've been trumpeting, you know, our, the, how we, the Valley communities have been moving forward and the steps that have been made. But I think we meet, need to be even more bold about how much more we could do here in the Valley Valley with those dollars for our residents, what it means you know, for jobs, what it means for quality of life, whether it be here in Ansonia or Derby or Seymour. I, I think the funds are out there. They're being given to other communities, but there's a great um, return on yeah. investment here when you're talking about jobs, when you're talking about quality of life, when you're talking about the things that government on the local or state level should be looking out for. I think a, a long time ago, um, and you, it, you, John's right, you're looking at uh, D Derby's downtown and the Route 34, and you're looking at Seymour Tritown Plaza. We want to get those projects moving. But a long time ago, uh, Congressman Maloney had the idea of putting a Main Street uh, Development Corporation together, which consisted of Derby, Ansonia, and Seymour. And it was centered around Fountain Lake uh, Park because he saw that as a regional property and a regional development project. And he got a, a sum of money to start that development corporation. And it was the right idea because the feds want to see a, uh, a regional entity. They want to put their funding into a, um, you know, a group of towns and cities together because uh, apart, we're very small. We're, we're so small that you know, it, make, it makes it difficult to get a large sum of money, although we've been successful in Ansonia. So what has to happen to create this sort of regional uh, development authority or corporation? And I mean, who's the, who, who do you hire to be the executive director? What are the next steps for this to happen? I think dialogue is the next step because certainly a, a development corporation could work for just Ansonia, but we really feel that a regional corporation makes more sense, especially because one town's project truly does impact across the board, across the valley. So I think it's that dialogue that's continuing, getting the idea out there, getting input from the other uh, municipal executives. And then uh, if it moves forward, it would be the creation of a legal entity. What form that takes, I think, is going to be the result of the collaboration between the, the municipalities. And I think Seymour and Ansonia already had started that process. We had conversations and uh, we talked to the EDC and they, and they agreed that probably it, was, it would be a stronger case to be made to do it collectively. Um, and so that, that was a good start, starting point, I believe. Okay. Well, we're pretty much uh, out of time uh, at this point. I mean, we're not really, but I'm just arbitrarily saying that because you know, <laughs> yeah. it gets to a certain point. But uh, I just wanted to ask uh, the three of you uh, in terms of, I mean, COVID-19, uh, I'm stealing this from a CCM does a radio show on New Haven and they asked the mayor of New Haven whether it's different to be sort of governing and trying to run a city in the middle of these insane times. So, uh, Mayor Cassetti, I, I just want to ask you, uh, what new challenges or how has your daily routine changed? Are people coming to you with different concerns? Because uh, obviously people are still very much worried about COVID-19, uh, COVID especially as the school year approaches. So how has it changed, if at all, well, your approach to how to get things done? I'm not able to meet with the people, but I got to tell you, Eugene, that this door in back of me is always open. And people come and go through this door, even though my staff says, don't let the people in. Put their masks they, on. They come in with right. their masks. People want to pay their taxes. They want to talk to me. They got problems. I mean, it's a little difficult because, you know, of the COVID. But I'm hoping to get back to normal within the next next month or so. I'm hoping. I'm, I'm really hoping to have City Hall open. We're doing all precautions. We got systems in place um, that we're currently doing in all the offices. So um, I'm hoping to get back to normal, as much as normal as possible, by the uh, 1st of September. Okay, that's good to hear. And John and Sheila, is there anything you wanted to add to that? I know it's an odd question, but I thought CCM asked it, so why not? Why can't I? I mean, I would say that the mayor's a people person, so this is really hurting him. He, he wants to be with people, and he wants to talk to his residents and tell them how much, you know, he, can, he wants to do for them. 
Uh, so it's, it's, I think it's taken its toll on the mayor and, and all of us, I guess. It's, it's just very different times where, you know, we're rearranging offices to make them safer for the public and for our employees. Um, so, uh, you know, just it's, it, it's changed the work environment almost completely. Mm. Yeah, local government's all about people. And so when you eliminate face to face, it really changes, you know, really changes the feel of what you're doing. But you got to remember, it still is about people, It's just about communicating with them in a different way. Um, and the mayor excels at communicating with people in any way. Um, he was very happy to move forward with the robocall program to keep residents up to date. And even still today, any way possible, even if it's from uh, his veranda, you know, he's going to stay in communication. You know, he's not going to let anything stop him from communicating and uh, sharing with the residents of Ansonia. All right. Well, unless anybody else has anything to add, uh, I just want to thank you all for taking time out of your schedule uh, to come and talk to me about this. I really thank do appreciate you. it. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks, you, Thanks for right. having me. Oh, my pleasure. So uh, until we meet again, stay yeah. safe. You too. Thank you.